What better way to bring physics to the masses than by tempting the taste buds? David Waits and Pia Sorensen are here now to explain how the properties of chocolate can be used to describe simple physics principles. Good morning. Thanks to you both. Thank Thanks you. For having us. Well, you really piqued my interest when we're bringing chocolate into the conversation about physics here. So I want to get started with a very broad question to the both of you. How can the very enjoyable everyday experience of having chocolate give us insights into the complex principles of non-equilibrium physics? Um, I really think it's everywhere. So if you pick up a piece of chocolate, like I have one right here, uh -huh. you first you just look at it and it's shiny and beautiful. You break it and there's a snap right. and it's still kind of a little bit shiny in the middle. Uh -huh. Then you hold it in your hand and uh, it doesn't melt, right. but I put it in my mouth where it's a little bit warmer uh -huh. and slowly over time it melts. Right. And all of that basically comes down to the perfect arrangement of the fat molecules in in the chocolate, and that is all basically governed by the non-equilibrium physics. And you know, Pia, when we actually looked into it to prepare for this uh, lecture we're giving, we found that everything about chocolate involves somehow non-equilibrium physics. It's so easy to find many, many examples of it. All right, so can you share some of the concepts of soft matter science that are illustrated through chocolate? Oh, there's so many things. <laughs> I mean, just the fact that it melts only in your mouth, and you know, it melts much slower in your hand. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that it has a nice crunch, the fact that it looks really nice. And what we really uh, will focus on when we talk about it is tempering of chocolate. Okay. It, if you don't temper chocolate, it turns white, it doesn't look right, but if you temper chocolate, it has this wonderful appearance and that all involves soft matter physics. And you both have your science and cooking aprons on here, we should point out. So there are equations. It, it, yes, uh, with equations on there. It looks like you're ready to um, you know, get busy producing chocolate. Um, Pia, are there examples from your work that have directly impacted the chocolate production process? So, um, the, so the, my, my thing, my passion and the, the focus of my research group is fermentation and fermentation technology. And basically all of it starts with this, right? So this is a, this is a coca pod, grows okay. right off the tree. Uh, first thing you do is you cut it open, you scoop out the seeds, which are white and, and pulpous and okay. a little bit sweet, almost has a mango taste. And then the first thing you do is you put them in a box or in a pile, in a heap, and you just wait for two to eight days. And oh. you think you're just waiting, but really there's a fermentation going. And there's a very precise um, succession of microbes that happen over time. So first the yeast come in, then the lactic acid bacteria come in then the acetic acid bacteria come in and each of them produce molecules that basically um, they grow from, but that hinders the growth of the others, um, of the other microbes. And, and in the process, you produce these flavor molecules. And then the next step, so there, there are all these different steps and all of them have the non-equilibrium physics, but all of them can also basically be improved in various way, ways by understanding it. And so they, they, the microbes produce these flavor precursors. And the next step, which is sun drying, okay. where basically the moisture disappears um, and evaporates in the sun. Um, some of those molecules diffuse in, the water diffuses out. The next step is roasting, where some of the flavor precursors, be, this is basically where the flavors of chocolate right. are produced. Right. And so um, what, what me and my students do is we basically look at all of those processes and we try to understand how each of them contribute to the flavors. Um, and, and to the molecules, but also to the experience you have in your mouth, and this amazing taste instrument that is your mouth as you, as you eat the chocolate. And isn't the roasting process, doesn't the length of the roasting process determine the strength of the chocolate or it, the flavor it, it does. makeup of it? It okay. does, but it's not only does. It, it, it's not the only thing. So it turns out if you take unfermented beans okay. and you roast them, you don't get the chocolate flavor. So that first fermentation step is key Jeez. for that flavor, which we love so much and which is so, it's so distinct. Interesting. All right, David, what are some of the real world applications or maybe the key takeaways from non-equilibrium physics um, that we might find in the context of understanding the chocolate making pro process? Well, as uh, we talked about before, the tempering of the chocolate, how that works, is, is really a very simple process, but it's all inherent non-equilibrium physics. And once you start understanding what non-equilibrium physics is, once you understand that really the world around us is primarily non-equilibrium. And uh, you know, we use chocolate, we use food, we use it as a way to illustrate what we want to teach, to illustrate the physics principles to the non-experts. And so when you can understand that 
oh, making chocolate doesn't involve simple things, it involves something that's way out of equilibrium. That appeals both to the expert physicist and it teaches the non-expert something about what we do as physicists. Right, you're speaking to the non-expert here. <laughs> um, can you also kind of go into the process of how chocolate making can illustrate physical concepts like viscosity, elasticity, those kinds of things? Sure, for the non-expert. Yes, <laughs> bring so, it down to my language here. <laughs> here's a piece of chocolate. Okay. Now listen carefully. Okay. That's, that's nice. elasticity. Okay. It's elastic, it's a solid. That's elasticity, that snap is because it's elastic. So just how it breaks. Its cons consistency as a solid is its elastic properties. Have a bite. Okay. Put it in your mouth. Let it melt. Don't mm -hmm. chew it. Let oh. it melt. Mm -hmm. It's very tasty. It flows. Mm -hmm. That's viscosity. How does it flow? How do you pour it? Does it pour very slowly? Does it pour very quickly? It depends on the temperature. That's viscosity. When it fills, when you take this form and fill it and pattern it, that's the flow dynamics. So it teaches everything. It does, and it's delicious, by the way. Pia, I want to talk about sustainability a little bit because this is certainly a crucial topic today. How do you see the sustainability aspects of chocolate production intersecting with the principles of physics? So I think it's there in almost every, every step, um, ju just, like, just like the other things we talked about. And there, each of these steps can be improved in various ways. And uh, we see this. Um, we, we see this in the chefs that come and visit the class. One of the things they are very preoccupied with right now is thinking about, well, like how can you use the whole right. pod, right? right? I mean, you cut this. This is actually very thick. It's like this thick, and really all you scoop out is is the is the beans. But how could you use the rest? Right. And so we've okay. had examples of chefs who come and basically show us how to make something delicious out of every single little piece and everything from juices to jellies to um, sort of crackly things to, to all, kinds of, all kinds of things. Um, and then there is the entire process in, in, um, from the drying to the roasting to the tempering and, and the kind of equipment and, and machinery that is involved in, in those processes. Right. If you've ever been, if you've actually been to a chocolate shop, you'll, you'll see these amazing instruments that are basically doing the work of tempering the chocolate and, and creating these, these pe perfect pieces. And, and each of those steps have, have steps that can really be improved and, and, um, and optimized for sustainability. Do you see parallels between the process involved in chocolate making and then other industrial processes um, that deal with soft matter? Absolutely. You know, soft matter is really something that's not too solid, not too fluid, it involves all sorts of things, and it can be a delicate material to process, yet that's what most food is. And so just understanding how to process food is understanding how to process soft matter. So tempering chocolate, pouring chocolate, making things with chocolate is just one way of industrializing things. But we industrialize everything. And for me, what I find fascinating is that the things that P and I deal with now when we talk about food, yes, we talk about industrial food, but we also talk about the chefs, how they do things. And everybody is trying to bring taste and texture and enjoyment to people. And it's bringing soft matter to everybody. It is. Okay, final question to the both of you. Given your, your unique perspectives, what do you think the most exciting thing is about taking the production of chocolate and the principles of physics and combining the two, other than the fact that you get to enjoy your research? For me, um, my passion in research is doing soft matter physics. Mm -hmm. And soft matter physics is not the most widely practiced, it's widely practiced, but the mo not the most widely practiced type of uh, condensed matter physics. Yet I can teach a class in soft matter physics without my colleagues saying, why are you teaching that kind of physics? Because I base it on food. Okay. And these equations, I can get people who don't use equations, who don't understand equations, I can teach them to use equations by teaching them about uh, science of cooking right. and enjoying chocolate. One thing everybody can understand. <laughs> Pia? I think the educational component is huge. And I think the fact that that this is a place where it becomes so obvious that the science that is there and what's shaping your experience is science we can understand. And it makes people curious. Um, and it makes students curious about 
every step of the process. And so regardless of whether you're interested in, um, in, in the flavor molecules or the soft matter properties or, or building equipment that would, would optimize the process, all of them have, have um, places where a student can come and bring their perspective, their background, and be curious about it and learn from it, but also contribute, as in this, the sustainability example. Right. Right. Well, thank you both so much. Absolutely love this topic. And thank you so much for sharing your research with me here. It's absolutely delicious. Eat more. <laughs> thank y'all.